Good morning. Um, I am delighted to be here to share with you some of what we are working on. Uh, so I will be talking about um, what I call imagery-based AI. Um, before I jump into what that means, I, I'm going to start with a short story about how I came to work on this topic. Uh, how many of you know who Temple Grandin is? So about half of you. Um, she's a fascinating lady. So she is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. And she also happens to be on the autism spectrum. Uh, it was early in grad school when I read this book. Um, it was assigned for a class. Uh, and in it, she talks about how, you know, this is her introspective uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, impression. She talks about how she thinks in pictures. And she talks about how, you know, for a lot of things that typically developing people think about verbally, for her, it's images. You know, when she thinks of a category, she likens it to Google image search. She says she just sees a bunch of images. Um, and interestingly, uh, this ability that she has, um, she says, has led to a lot of her successes in her professional life. So uh, she's an animal scientist, and in particular, she designs equipment for the livestock industry. And when she got into this field, she was able to sort of design and think about very complicated facilities that had like lots of moving pieces. And she talks about how she was, she could kind of troubleshoot potential problems before the facility got built. And she would come in as a consultant when people were having trouble with their facilities. Um, she was super successful. And in fact, on her website, it says over half the livestock in this country goes through equipment that she either designed or worked on, which is incredible. Um, so she also talks about how this visual thinking propensity um, causes her difficulties in some areas as well. So she has trouble thinking about abstract concepts sometimes, for example. Um, so I read this, um, like I said, it was, it was kind of early in grad school, and I thought it was fascinating. It's a great book if you haven't read it. And it was really interesting to me to think about, you know, how does that kind of information processing work? Like, what are the actual computations that are happening in Temple Grandin's brain when she is you know, building and thinking about these uh, kinds of, you know, complicated mechanical systems. Um, and of course, you know, she is not the only example um, of somebody who thinks in this interesting way. Here's a great quote uh, from Richard Feynman. Also, I get to sneak a bad word into these talks, um, but he said it, not me. So Richard Feynman sort of famously, um, you know, talked about how his mathematical thinking um, was quite visual. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with Rich. You know, it's not, there's a lot here we don't understand. It, it can't be sort of like a literal visualization of, you know, how do you see these intervals around, um, around the fractions between 0 and 1? Uh, but this is another example. You know, like, what are the actual, what are the computations that Richard Feynman was doing when he was pushing around these thoughts in his mind? So that is really the question that I um, would like to answer. And so the vision that I have for my research um, is that really, you know, there's, there's lots, of, lots of kinds of models, you know, presumably that the brain builds. Um, but what I want to understand is in computational terms, what is the power of perceptual imagery and what are the limitations? And you know, going back to this question about modeling, I, you know, there's a famous quote about models. I'm sure you guys have heard, um, all models are wrong. Some are useful. Um, and so I think, you know, when I, um, when I think about perceptual imagery, it's, you know, like what, what uh, it's not so much, you know, can you model X or Y with it? But, you know, if you do have such a model, is it useful for various kinds of reasoning tasks? Um, and what are the limitations? And in particular, at least to start with, I'm focusing on visual imagery. Um, and so as, you know, we were just talking about, uh, the, the fact that we sort of have this uh, very highly structured apparatus for thinking about information that's essentially projected onto the 2D plane of our retina and sort of like the associated um, parts of our visual cortex. Um, you know, what do we do? What can we do with that information? And I, um, no, I'm not, you know, in, in my work, I don't focus so much on perception, um, but more on, you know, how can we use this kind of information for other kinds of reasoning tasks? You know, imagery, like when you are thinking about visual information, that's not exactly what's hitting your eyeballs at that moment. Um, and of course, you know, this is uh, leaving out a lot of important things. So we, you know, we, I don't really, I have not yet gotten into auditory imagery or forces and proprioception. You know, there's a lot of, I think, of, uh, of other forms of imagery. But for now, anyways, uh, I'm, I'm starting with visual. 
So how are we doing this um, from an AI perspective? How can you actually understand these computations? So essentially, this is our, these are our methods. So um, the first thing we do, you know, as you know, most AI people uh, like to build things. Uh, so uh, we build AI systems that do reasoning tasks using visual imagery. So the, the shorthand is, you know, essentially, can you reason by pushing pixels around in some kind of image space um, that you're maintaining? And then once we have this kind of system, we can do lots of computational experiments on that. We can you know, take out pieces and add pieces and kind of characterize its performance. You know, how does it do on hard problems? How does it do on easy problems? Um, we also can compare with human performance, um, including looking at you know, developmental changes and how, um, you know, how do children solve things versus how do adults, um, and also uh, looking at sort of different developmental trajectories. So for example, people with autism. And then, so that's kind of, you know, step one, and that's where we started. More recently, um, you know, I've been, we've been thinking about, you know, given, you know, we've, we build this AI system and you have it sitting there. Obviously, there's a lot of our knowledge that's going into the system as the designers. And if we really want to understand how people are doing that task or how an intelligent agent could sort of come to autonomously do this task, um, we have to, for every single thing we write down, we have to figure out how it could be learned instead. And so I'll, I'll talk about a couple of examples of that um, in this talk. So um, the, uh, the, we're, we're looking at this broad problem at many different levels. Um, you know, so starting with you know, thinking about sort of high level reasoning in you know, naturalistic, unstructured domains, like you know, creative engineering design and things like that. So that's, you know, those, are, those are hard problems. So we, we cannot yet you know, build a model of what Temple Grandin's brain is doing. So we are starting with something a bit simpler, which is looking at how people think during highly sort of well-structured um, visuospatial reasoning problems, mostly from intelligence tests. So that's kind of like our, our simpler domain. Um, and it's, it's a, it, it, well, anyways, uh, I'll talk later about why that is. It's simple, it's simpler, but not simple. Like I think they're still quite complex problems. Um, but then, you know, interestingly, if you look at how adults solve intelligence tests, we realize, well, you can't actually explain all of that just by looking at the adult themselves. You have to look at where they learned all of these sort of fundamental cognitive skills that they're using, and that happens in childhood and infancy. So then we've been working with developmental psychologists to kind of look at, you know, how are visuospatial um, reasoning operations and this kind of, you know, this basic knowledge that you, you have as an adult, how does that get learned in childhood, and can we, you know, build computational systems that will actually learn that knowledge and then be able to deploy it on an intelligence test? But then, you know, when you look at how infants learn, uh, infants or young children, of course that brings you to the brain. And then in order to really understand the kinds of things that they can learn and, and why they're learning what, when, um, you have to start thinking about how the brain works. And so then we've, of course, gotten into looking at various types of neural networks. Um, we look a little bit at deep learning, but we're also um, pushing now toward, you know, uh, if you have worked with the sort of standard deep learning networks, you know that they are very unlike the brain in a lot of ways. Um, and so uh, part of our research here is, you know, if we're, we're thinking about how, you know, uh, learning these basic visual ideas um, comes about in early childhood, uh, it's, uh, we're trying to figure out, are there other kinds of learning mechanisms other than, you know, backpropagation and the sort of standard, um, standard approaches used today that can drive the kind of multifaceted learning that we think is happening in children? Okay, so, so there you have the brain. Then we realized, it's kind of getting ridiculous at this point, but we realized if you really want to understand, you know, why the brain is learning, you know, why are these learning mechanisms set up this way? And in particular, you know, why is the retina set up? the way it is, that's kind of like a key part of all of this. Like where do you get these retinotopic, uh, why do you have these retinotopic representations? We realize, well, you actually have to think about evolution. And why is it that a 2D projection of information from a 3D world is in fact useful for intelligent organisms at all? Um, and so we've been starting to look at that. So we, we're kind of using a lot of different methods at all of these levels of inquiry um, to try to, to build up this sort of full pipeline um, of learning and reasoning. So um, I, I'm just going to briefly mention a couple of related projects that I unfortunately am not going to have time to talk about today. But um, Rebecca yesterday was talking about 
theory of mind. Um, and, you know, she made this wonderful point that, you know, all of these, you know, mental states, like beliefs and, um, you know, desires and goals are all invisible. And somehow we have the ability to reason about those things. So um, through our autism work, um, we had been um, thinking a lot. So a lot of people with autism do have problems with theory of mind. Um, reasoning abilities. And interestingly, it is kind of tying to Rebecca's, you know, her, I don't know if you guys remember, the three sort of possible theories of, of why, uh, like connections between language and theory of mind. And so um, the one that she talked about was maybe it's access to sort of mental state words that gives you the ability to represent those ideas. So in autism, it's kind of an interesting um, example because I think a lot of those individuals may have, you know, they, they may have some language impairments, but they actually, they sort of get exposed to those, those theory of mind um, words, but then they still have problems sort of thinking about the concept. So our hypothesis is maybe, if you, suppose you have somebody who's really predisposed towards thinking visually, thinking in terms of sort of the, the concrete images that they see, could it be that part of their theory of mind problem comes from an inability to represent those abstract concepts? And so, Building on that hypothesis, we have a project um, in collaboration with several other folks at Vanderbilt uh, where we're taking, um, we're essentially building an educational technology to try to teach theory of mind reasoning abilities to middle school students on the spectrum. Um, and we're drawing from science education. So, in, so this picture is a picture of an existing technology um, developed by Gautam Biswas, who's uh, one of my collaborators on this. And it's for teaching complex systems to middle schoolers. So complex systems in science have a lot of things that are invisible, like these causal relationships. You know, why, why is it that when, you know, um, the, uh, the chemical composition of a lake changes in one way, you know, the fish population will also change. Like you cannot see that relationship. And so they, they developed the system, and there's a, there's a lot more to it. Um, but one of the features of the system they developed is that it makes these causal links explicit and visible. Um, and so we're essentially adapting this technology to see if we can use that to make social relationships and sort of relations between beliefs and desires and actions explicit. Um, and we just started the project this year, so I don't have any results yet, but um, it is in progress. Um, another project, um, again, that I'll just briefly mention is um, we're also looking at data visualization. So if you think about things like scatter plots or, you know, any of this, we're, uh, you know, as scientists, we use these kinds of visual visualizations all the time. Um, and in a way, you can kind of think of that, you know, we're making these relationships in data that we've gathered, we're making them visible. Um, and so we have a project where we're essentially trying to understand, you know, what are the cognitive processes that are going in when a person is sort of looking at data and you know, picking out relationships. So um, in this talk, I will be focusing um, on some of our other work. Um, and again, thank you to Rebecca, because I loved your outline slide, and I'm not always trying to figure out how to do outline slides, so now I've stolen your format a little bit here. I hope you don't mind. Um, so this talk has three um, sort of sections, um, as you see here. So I'll start by talking about some of our work on, um, you know, building, you know, kind of the, the the first uh, kind of work I mentioned, you know, building a system that uses imagery um, to do a reasoning task. So uh, the first, one of the first things that we worked on um, is a test, an intelligence test called the Ravens Progressive Matrices Test. How many of you guys have seen this before or heard of this? So well, like three quarters of you. So here's an example of the kind of problem from this test. Any guesses? Two, yes, so this one is, the answer is two. Here's a slightly more difficult one. Any ideas? I heard four and three. Any other guesses? So the answer to this one is four. Um, I should say I came up with this problem and it has not been normed. So if you disagree with me, you probably um, have grounds. <clears throat> okay, so you can get an idea of, of what these problems look like. And so it turns out um, that uh, this problem has been studied for a long time by AI researchers. Um, in fact, one of the sort of early AI systems 
um, was built to solve problems like this. So it's a, you know, the general class of problems are geometric analogies. Um, and Evans um, wrote a program um, which is kind of a, a cool bit of trivia. At the time that he wrote it, it was the largest program ever written in Lisp to date. Um, it was so big uh, that his program had like two, it, it had two stages and he actually had to load each, he had to load the punch cards for each one, punch cards, right, into the computer um, in different steps um, because it was so big. So, so he had written um, a, a program that could solve these kinds of problems. And what's interesting is that the problem information was represented like this. So this is a very, if, you've, if you're an AI researcher, this is like a familiar uh, looking representation. Um, so it's basically like a list of relations and attributes um, and sort of these you know, uh, property elements extracted from the problems. And there's been several other um, efforts over the years that are kind of exploring different aspects of problem solving um, from an AI perspective, but they all used representations that were symbolic in this way. So um, when I, you know, it was one of these confluences, having just read Thinking in Pictures, and then I sort of found out about this test, and I was thinking, ah, I wonder, I wonder how Temple Grandin would go about solving the Raven's test. You know, maybe she wouldn't be building representations like this. Could you actually solve this test if all you were doing was thinking about the images that were there? So uh, we decided to build an AI system to try to do this. Um, and one of the interesting things that happens, you know, when you sort of restrict yourself to images, as a computer programmer, you lose access to a lot of your common reasoning operations. So a lot of times, you know, when you're writing a piece of computer code, you're relying on logical um, operations to sort of drive your reasoning. Uh, and we realized if, you know, if all you have from the problem is images, um, then you have to use a different set of visual reasoning primitives. And so these are some of the examples. So we had um, rotations and reflections, and we had image composition. So you could literally just add pixels together or subtract them um, or do an intersection. Um, and I should point out, so we, we were doing this work. There was no um, notion of features at all. We were just looking at the pixels you know, on the page, essentially. Um, so we designed a system um, to solve these problems, and the way that it worked um, is essentially it would look at rows and columns. So it had a sort of a pri you know, it had, it had some built-in um, machinery to focus on rows and columns, so we didn't make it, you know, sort of figure that out on its own. Um, and then it would, uh, it had a library of these transformations that I just showed you, um, and it would just try all of them. It would kind of like apply a transformation to one image and compare it to the other images, um, and to figure out, you know, what is sort of given its own library, what is the best fit transform that it could figure out. Um, and then it would uh, compare the prediction to the answer choice. Um, so uh, the, um, all of the reasoning was done using visual operations. And another cool thing is that we actually, because it was just using images, we were just able to scan the test and feed it in. So we didn't have to do any kind of pre-processing on the inputs. Um, here's an illustration of how it works. Uh, let's see. Oh, there it goes. So for example, looking at the top row, you know, is this an identity transform? Well, let me, you know, try applying identity, which does nothing, and then compare it. It's not very similar. Is this a clockwise rotation? And this was, you know, uh, again, you know, not, not a great match. And it would just go through its library. It was doing exhaustive search. There was no heuristics to this. Um, is it a horizontal flip? Oh, it turns out that that is looking pretty similar. So then it would decide maybe this transformation that I have is the right one. Um, and then it would apply this to the empty row or column, generate a solution. And then um, given its image that it predicted as the answer, it would then compare it to the answer choices um, and then pick the most similar one. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is how our system worked. Um, before I show you the results um, that our system got, um, here are human norms on the Ravens test. Um, so you can see, so this is for typically developing children in the United States. Um, the test is scored out of 60 correct, which is on the y-axis. Um, and then on the horizontal axis, we have age. And so you can kind of, you know, follow along and see that um, the average, you know, I guess the average uh, eight-year-old would get like in the mid-20s. Average 14-year-old is getting up, you know, a little bit above 40. Um, so how did our system do? Turns out our system got 50 out of 60 correct, which um, was quite surprising, actually, because till this time, people had assumed, you know, kind of in the, in the psychometric literature, 
um, there, you know, there had also been a lot of, you know, human studies of this test, and people had kind of assumed that you might use your visual system for the very easy problems, but once you got to the hard problems, you would need to be, you know, you would sort of start, you would see, start to see neural activation in language centers in in neuroimaging studies, um, and there's, you know, a lot of evidence that you would you'd sort of switch reasoning strategies to something that was more analytical and you know, maybe symbolic. Um, so this was kind of like a, a this was kind of a proof of concept at least that. Uh, in, you know, in theory, you could get at almost all the problems on this test using only images and visual operations. And there was some interesting work right around the time we were doing this. Um, there was actually a, a neuroimaging study of people with autism, adults on the autism spectrum, solving the test. Um, and what they found was that they actually showed a very different neural activation pattern from compared to typically developing people. Um, and so they didn't actually show a switch. In fact, they sort of looked like visual problem solvers the whole way through. So it was like a nice bit of sort of convergent um, evidence for maybe, you know, maybe there's something to this um, imagery thing for, for at least some people with autism. So uh, we've since then kind of generalized our system so that we could tackle more and more different kinds of tasks. Um, and this is just a, a rough diagram um, of what our you know, imagery-based architecture looks like. Um, and it's, it's, you know, the, the main parts are really that you know, it, has, um, it has kind of an eye, you know, a, a gaze that it can like, look around um, inputs, and then it can capture what it sees. So it's just a very literal, um, you know, in our case, uh, you know, again, no like feature extraction or anything, but it's just capturing a snapshot of what it sees. And then um, it can store those kind of mental images in a buffer and then manipulate them using various imagery operators. Um, and then it can, you know, use that to, uh, to hopefully solve some problems. So, um, so that was kind of a, an example um, of, of this first part of work that we did. Um, but then we, you know, we kind of realized, so we were at that point, you know, we had built this system, and then we started thinking about, well, what, it, what is all the stuff that we actually built into the system, right? Going back to my, um, my earlier point about, for everything that we just wrote down, can we get the system to learn it instead? Um, and from that, I have kind of come to believe that intelligence tests are, in fact, quite a, a good and hard problem for AI. Um, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, but I'll explain. So when you look at this, so if you showed this, for example, to a typical computer vision researcher nowadays, they would say this is an easy input. Because it's not, you know, it's not photorealistic, there's no shadows, it's all just black and white pixels, it's simple shapes. And in some ways, you know, they're right. Like this is a, uh, in some ways, this is an easy image um, for a computer to, to reason about. But, if you think a little bit more carefully about what you, what did you actually do when you solved this problem? I didn't actually even give you any instructions on how to solve the problem. I just said, here's a problem, solve it. And you guys did. So, um, it, it, so this is kind of why, um, so with intelligence tests also, I think uh, an important thing to remember is how people are actually intended to take them. So a person, a person is not supposed to practice at an intelligence test. In fact, if you practice, it's like invalid. It's not even a valid score anymore. It's supposed to be, in fact, a test of what in AI we call transfer learning. So you, you, you've had your lifetime of experience doing your usual kinds of things. You come into a room and you sit down and you're asked to solve these tasks that you've never seen before. And that's, in fact, what intelligence tests um, are asking people to do. So we realized that's really what you should be asking AI systems to do is if you've never seen this before, how do you actually figure out, you know, not just, you know, it's, it's not as, the, anyways, yeah, so how do you actually figure out, um, not just how to solve this problem, but what the problem even is? Um, and so uh, I also have a short story to kind of illustrate this. This point was made very clear to me um, when I uh, was watching an orangutan one time a few years ago. So I was at the Atlanta Zoo where they do some fascinating um, cognitive research with their group of orangutans. And uh, I was there one time where there's this one orangutan and he was in the process of being trained up to do a particular task. I think, so I, this, that, that's not what this image is, but I think it was orangutan face recognition. You know, it was kind of like, can orangutans recognize other orangutans like really well? So um, the particular task that he was doing was a delayed match to sample task. So he would basically see you know, a face and then it would disappear and then he would see options and then he had to pick the, the right one. Um, and like I said, I, I got to see, it was, he was just starting out his session for that day, so he was all energetic and excited. You know? So they, they wheeled the touch screen up. Um, and then they showed him the first problem. So, and I'm just using shapes here instead of pictures to make it easier to see. So you, you know, he sees his first thing, 
it disappears, the choices come up. He like hits the right answer and he gets his food and he's like super happy, he gets to like eat his, his treat. Um, so I was like, ah, oh, this guy like knows what he's doing. Um, then the second problem came up. It's a different, different stimulus. Um, he sees it, you know, it disappears, the choices come up, he picks the wrong one. I was like, oh no, you know, like no food for you, poor guy. Um, but then it turns out, since he was just in training, all hope was not yet lost, um, because to help him learn the task, they had this thing they were doing where um, if he got it wrong, they would remove two of the incorrect answer choices. So then he should have like a 50-50 chance of getting it right. His idea is, you know, they want him to get it right because he's still learning, you know, how to do the task. So he gets the, the next screen, where it's, you know, it's the same stimulus, and he gets the next screen with, with two of the choices removed, and guess what he did? He hit that same spot. It was black. There was nothing on the screen. And he was like just kind of jabbing it with his finger, um, getting it wrong. And it was funny because, you know, I know we're not supposed to anthropomorphize, but he sure looked like, you know, when your phone freezes up or something and you're like, I know this should be working. And he was like totally jabbing at that spot um, really aggressively and he was getting kind of, looked, he looked frustrated. Um, and so this was really interesting to me. You know, again, it, as an AI person, if you showed me that time, this, you know, this bottom time t equals six display, anybody would say there's two possible actions you can take. And so when you write your system, you would write it as, you know, here are the two possible actions which one are you gonna choose? And your reasoning problem is just to pick one of the two alternatives. But in fact, like, we don't have just two choices when we're in that situation. We have an infinite number of choices. Like, you could do anything you want. So how do you even know that those two are your two choices for the task at hand? You know, like, the concept of multiple choice is, you know, it must be learned. And it's a pretty sophisticated thing. Um, to, to think about, you know, you have these, these options and, you know, how do you identify? So this is kind of like a, a second um, major thrust of our um, research these days um, is something that we're calling nonverbal task learning. So task learning is actually kind of a recent um, uh, uh, field area of interest in AI led by John Laird up at Michigan and, and, you know, kind of lots of other folks are looking at it. And it's the idea that in, so, in an, so much of AI has focused on, you know, you give it the task definition, you give it the inputs and outputs, and then can it learn how to do the task better? But how do systems actually, how do intelligent agents actually learn what a task is to begin with? Um, and there's a lot of work in task learning on verbal instructions. So, you know, when you learn to play a board game, how do you learn? You know, you sit down and somebody says to you, you know, here are the valid pieces and here's the goal and here's what you do and you kind of are able to process that. So that's, um, there's also a lot of work in robotics on that right now. You can imagine, you know, that would be a great way to be able to teach a robot to do a new task to sort of explain. We're focusing on, how can you learn tasks without language? Um, and in particular, I've kind of, we've recently been working on um, this fascinating class of intelligence tests called nonverbal intelligence tests, which were designed to be able to be given to people with language difficulties. Um, and so the idea is these are intelligence tests where you don't actually require any verbal instructions. And the way that you teach people what a task means is you show them an example. I mean, it's all, it's like very, so there's the one that we're working on right now is called the lighter. Have any of you ever used the lighter test? Um, okay, yeah, it's, it's I, I didn't actually know about it until I met a guy um, in England who was using it because uh, he studies cognition in minimally verbal kids on the autism spectrum. So it's, it's kind of, it's used, you know, in these sort of clinical populations quite a lot. Um, but anyways, so here's kind of an example uh, of what a nonverbal task learning system ought to be able to do. So you get an input like this. And then you should be able, basically you have that input, that's the only instructions you get. And then you should be able to solve new problems um, that are, you know, of the same type, whatever that means. Um, and, you know, there's some interesting, um, you know, properties of this. So, for example, you should be able to generalize to different numbers of answer choices, right? As a person, if you saw this, the E example, and then you're looking at P2, now there's eight choices instead of six. But none of us would have pro any trouble dealing with that. We would just be like, oh yeah, now there's six answer choices that I need to consider. Um, so, um, so this is kind of um, a non-trivial uh, AI problem. I, I'm afraid I'd, I think I'm not gonna have time to go in detail, but um, we've designed a system uh, where this is just all of the, the sort of gory details, but you can, you know, I can explain it all to you in later if you like. But one of the sort of key ideas behind this system is that a lot of, you know, when you see a visuospatial task like this, um, 
you can get a long way if you think about how you group things according to gestalt principles. So like, why are those six things the answer choices? Well, because they all kind of look the same. They're in the same part of the table. They're the same shape. Um, and you know, why do they go into this hole in the matrix? Well, you know, they have the same outline. Um, and I don't, you know, it's, it's a, uh, so we're, we're kind of working on this system to d define a bunch of these metrics um, and then essentially be able to cluster elements based on them and then hopefully, you know, learn that you know, the, what you have to do in this task is you have to find this cluster of things that kind of looks the same and move it to that other object that, you know, has, has a certain similarity. Okay. Um, so uh, let me go ahead to, okay. So then, so I've, I've talked to you a little bit about, um, you know, how you might, you know, given this, art, so from the starting point, now we've pulled back a little bit and said, well, we have to learn, the system now has to learn what the task is. Another category of learning is, you remember our, we had our list of visuospatial reasoning primitives, like these operators. Like where does, where does something like mental rotation come from or image composition? So we have been um, talking to, oops, why is, oh, there we go. Um, we have been talking to um, Linda Smith and Chen Yu at Indiana University, um, oops, okay. Um, who, of course, uh, so who have sort of um, done this fascinating work where they put head cameras on babies and you get to see like a baby's eye view of the world. Um, and so here's an example um, off of uh, Linda's website of, you know, like this is, this is what like a baby, you know, this is what a little kid sees. <laughs> and this is really valuable learning opportunity. Um, and so we are uh, looking at, you know, how do inputs, how can you maybe, how can a system pull from inputs like that to learn about things like how objects transform and then be able to you know, reproduce them mentally, so to speak. Um, we realized that the, uh, the actual infant videos are quite tough to work with because infants you know, bounce around a lot and move and they're, they're you know, hard images. Um, so we actually collected a data set um, that's a little bit simpler where we have a bunch of objects um, that undergo structured transformations um, and you can download this um, from the internet, uh, we have 360 objects. Uh, I think it's 30 examples from 12 different categories. So it's hopefully useful for like some recognition experiments too. And we're essentially building some neural networks that will learn um, operations like rotation and translation and scaling by watching those kinds of structured videos and then be able to apply them to new images like in the context of an intelligence test. Um, and I, again, don't have time to actually talk about this, but I will show you this fascinating video of uh, a standard neural network watching one of our toy box videos. Um, a standard, this is one of the object recognition networks. And we're, we're also realizing we can use this data set to do some interesting studies of, you know, how do um, sort of current uh, neural networks for recognition think about or handle, you know, viewpoint changes um, and things like that. So Xiaohan, um, who is working with us on this project, I think is going to be talking more. So Shahan is there. You guys can all see him. And then, uh, so later he'll be doing a lightning talk, I think, and a poster on this kind of stuff. Okay, so um, the final sort of observation um, that I will make is that we realized, so when we were doing these experiments about, you know, learning transformations, we made this um, sort of discovery that it turns out topology matters of your network. So this is interesting. So think about, you know, in, in virtually, I think, I would, you know, 99.9 something percent of all of the AI systems that have ever been built that use images in any form or fashion, those images are virtually always rectangular arrays of pixels. And rectangular arrays of pixels, if, you're, if you start thinking about motion, um, they're very good for representing some kinds of motion. Like, so, so these are kind of, uh, uh, these are, um, uh, visualizations of some of the networks that we built that learn different transformations. Um, so, you know, vertical translation is like beautiful in, in a rectangular array of pixels. You can, you know, it's, you can, you can perfectly capture um, information that's just moving up. Rotation is quite ugly. Um, and that's why, you know, in image processing, there have been, you know, so much effort over the years to develop algorithms for doing rotations that will look okay once you've, you know, once you've applied the rotation to an image. Um, we sort of pulled from, um, we pulled an idea from a quite old paper um, uh, from, uh, uh, by a guy named, oh my gosh, now I'm blinking, um, Funt, Brian Funt. Uh, 
um, in uh, 1980, I think. And he had this idea of what if you have circular image representations? Because those then become very good for rotation. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've kind of implemented that. And of course, it's kind of like an obvious, um, obvious result. Uh, and this, this right hand side is scaling um, in and out. Uh, and so then we've realized um, that, uh, you know, of course, the human retina has a spatial distribution and topology of neurons that is like very, it's not, you know, rectangular, but it's also not just like circular. So then we kind of started asking about, um, you know, how do you, uh, you know, where does that sort of 2D arrangement come from? And so now we've, we've gotten a little bit into looking at evolution. And I'll just do this really, really quick snapshot of this, and then I'll be done. Um, so just two weeks ago, we have our, we've been, we've basically been asking this question of if you have, you know, if you have intelligent organisms swimming around in the primordial soup, you know, uh, why would you get, why would you get um, an, uh, a form of representation that's capturing in 2D the structure of the world around them? So we're starting out with a little bit simpler problem where we have um, guys like swimming around. They're swimming around in 2D, so we're trying to see if they can essentially acquire a 1D retina. Um, and so they, they, have, uh, they have like photosensor cells, and then they have little motor cells that they can swim around. And these green things are food. So this is just set up as a, a sort of standard evolutionary um, algorithm. And you know, we were playing around with it for a while. Everything kept dying. Um, but then a couple of weeks ago, we got our first sort of surviving species. And this is it. I'll, I'll play the video in a second. But it's, it's actually a little bit funny because my student forgot to put a constraint that the motor cells have to stay inside the body. So, so this is actually the body. The blue things are its eye cells. Um, the red things are its motor cells. And the white things are the connections. And you can see, so this guy has like a motor like way out here. Um, but the, but the, the way they swim around is sort of an interesting strategy. So they, when they don't see food, they kind of just cruise. They're like cruising in these like big circles. So like one of their, their motors. But then as soon as they see food, that outside motor, it has like a large moment because it's so far out. And it just like pulses when it sees the food and it like swims them towards the, towards the food, which is neat. So anyway, so this is our first sort of um, evolved life. Um, so uh, I, will, um, I will stop there. Um, I actually recently redid my slides um, based on, if you guys know Patrick Winston, he's coming out with his new communication book. So if you liked these slides or if you thought they were bad, you can send your complaints to him. Um, and uh, acknowledgments, of course, like lots of, um, uh, of wonderful collaborators and students. And I will stop there. I went a little bit over.